Welcome to Behind the Music, the Houston Chamber Choir's weekly podcast. I'm Sinjin Flynn. Joined this time by cellist Norman Fisher, who is on the faculty at the Shepherd School of Music at Rice University, and he is featured on the Grammy-winning Durafle recording that the Houston Chamber Choir put out last year. Norman, welcome. Thanks so much, Sinjin. It's fun spending time with you. Looking forward to this. We are in strange times, but but everything is good. You are safe and well. Oh yes, and and working like a crazy person. Uh, anybody that's in my in my profession knows that we're actually, if we're doing in person teaching as we are at Rice, mm -hmm. uh, with masks, with additional time to clear rooms for you know air and ventilation, doing some virtual teaching, it's. A whole new thing. Right. Uh, I have five chamber groups that I'm coaching and they're all socially distanced. So playing in a string quartet when you're occupying a very large space is challenging, but it's, it's, it's exhilarating, but, but it has its uh, rewards that were sort of almost back to normal kind of thing as far as music is concerned. Right. Right. I want to talk about, um, your performance on the uh, the Durifle recording. Um, the cello comes in in the, in the Pie Jesu in the, the Durifle Requiem. And it's uh, in, in essence, it's the cello and mezzo soprano. Tell us a little bit about that piece, that movement from the Requiem. You know, it is, it is, so heavenly, the whole thing. And it is, um, you know, it, that, that P.A. Yezu, also the one from the Foray Requiem, you know, which is also incredibly, incredibly beautiful. I mean, these are just masterworks. And they sort of suspend in time in the, sort of this upward mm. space. It's, it's, it's really quite remarkable. I, I, I didn't know it until I was asked to play it and then right. I sort of inhabited it, if you know what I mean. You get, you get into a space like that and then finding the sound and finding the energy and finding where the lines will take you, this kind of stuff is, is transporting. Because it's, it's a, a brief section. Um, but the, the cello and the mezzo are both so exposed, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. You, uh, you've, got to, you've got to know what you're doing. <laughs> yes, you spend, you, you spend a, little bit of, a little bit of time preparing it, or another way of looking at that, 50 years preparing for it, or 60 years <laughs> yes. preparing for it. <laughs> what was the process of recording the uh, piece like? Well, of course, we're in that beautiful uh, organ hall at Rice. It just it's such a such a stunning sound, and because of the way the the steps are terraced down away from the organ console, we we found um, the mezzo and I found different positions to be on the steps. Oh, really? It was a little space uh, from from the organ, and you know it was. Um, I don't know. It was a kind of inspiring. It it seemed like it just went by in a in a flash. I'm not sure how many takes we had of the entire movement. Uh, maybe three, four, five, and then we did a couple of small uh, sections again. Mm -hmm. But it was incredibly easy and wonderful. Working I should say that the the mezzo soprano was Cecilia Duarte. Yes, exactly. And uh, Ken Cowan uh, at the organ. Yeah. Um, so when you recorded that movement, was it in front of the of the whole choir, or were you alone? It was just the three of us. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and and um, which was which was great because it really gave us the, the ability to f sort of feel. It was just you know, like a small ensemble in that large, in the both large uh, work, but also in the large space. Yeah. 
How did you come to be performing with the choir? I was asked. <laughs> <laughs> it's always nice to be asked. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Bob, Bob Simpson, I, I've known him for some time in the 90s. And, you know, I became a sort of a regular uh, participant in the um, in Christmas and Easter if they were using strings. And it was a great joy to to be there with him and with with uh, the choir. And so I'm not not sure exactly what that but when he had this opportunity and he wanted to ask me if I could possibly do it. And I said, absolutely, I'd be glad to do that. So this wasn't your first time performing with the choir. First time performing, it was not the first time performing with Bob, because I was, re, that was, that I was, but the first time with the chamber choir. Right. Okay. Right. Were you, uh, this is a, uh, I don't know if this is a good question or not, were you, were you surprised that, uh, that this uh, CD won the Grammy? Maybe just because I've been down the block with the Grammys since I first started recording. <laughs> I had a Grammy nomination in 73 and 75 um, for projects with a Concord String Quartet. Um, and then vicariously with all my friends that had uh, CDs in the running. And it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a horse race all the time. You just never quite know how the Academy will be, will be voting. Of course, right. I was delighted, you know, of course, but right. Um, right. Um, one of my very close friends is the, is the um, re uh, recording producer, Judith Sherman. And uh, she's done a lot of our CDs and she is most years a candidate for producer of the year in, in classical CD production. And, uh, and so I'm al always, always sort of hanging on to sort of see how Judy's going to do. Uh, <laughs> you know? um, and her husband, Kurt Mackenberg, is also a violinist and recording artist. And we play, have played a lot with Kurt, too. Yeah. Now, when you say our recordings, you're talking about the Fisher duo. Yeah, the Fisher duo and the Concord String Quartet were the two principal groups that I've been, that I played with, yeah. The Fisher duo, uh, the, the other member, is uh, a woman named Jeannie Kierman Fisher. Exactly. Right. And are you related? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. She's my wife. <laughs> right. And a pianist. Um, I think the duo started, you got together in 1971. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, we were both um, uh, students at the Oberlin Conservatory. For uh, did our undergraduate training there, and um, the first performance that we did together as a duo was on the commencement recital at Oberlin, the Arpeggione Sonata of Schubert, uh -huh. and um, and so that was just two days before we actually did the had the graduation ceremony, and then we were sort of out of town. So. When you started to play together, were you dating? Yes. Actually, yes. Um, I avoided playing with her for quite a while um, um, because I was afraid of getting involved with her romantically. And then that, when that became inevitable, then I said, then I embraced the opportunity to play with her because she's a fabulous pianist. And we, of course, there's a, a beautiful chemistry there. Uh, and through the years, you know. Next year will be the 50th anniversary exactly. of the duo. Exactly. It just, just bang, it's there, yeah. So it's very exciting. <clears throat> What's it like working with your wife? Has that ever presented any problems or I assume you get along like a house on fire, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, when we first started doing, when we first started working together, um, it was tricky, you know, because you want to, there was a lot of 
energy that had to go into affirmation while well, you could be critical and, mm -hmm. and this sort of thing. And then um, as the years went on, we had to worry about that kind of thing less and less and just get right to the core or essence of it. So rehearsals became super efficient. Um, right. As the years have gone on, there's so, there so many hours of rehearsal and playing together that not that we're talking less and playing more in a rehearsal. So that it has a, it has to do with with uh, going down the channel, experiencing the work together, uh, how we listen to one another and be able to anticipate what the other is, is going to do is a big part of the success of that. So, for example, sometimes when we're um, performing something and I get this idea that I want to just hold a long note much longer than that we'd ever done it, but it just uh, what I feel at the moment, and then, and then just risk it, see what happens, and let it hang, and then on the other side of that starts falling off. And then after the concert, I'd say, how did you know that I was going to do that? Because it was completely together, you know? And she says, did you do that? Do something different? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it becomes so such an unconscious kind of thing that you're you're in the same kind of track, same kind of zone. I mean, after after fifty years, you you can almost anticipate how you know, Jeannie is going to play something, or you yeah. know, and she can do the same with yeah. you. Well, now now let me let me ask you a question, Sinjin. Do you know the A. R. Gurney play called Love Letters? No, it's it's a it's a vehicle that many older actors apparently do this as a kind of a showcase. So actors that have been around that have been there for a very long time and they played in movies and and theater and all this kind of stuff together and they sit down on a stage and the play is written for them to be reading the script at, at adjacent tables. And they're reading these love letters that Gurney wrote about a, a couple that have been together for a very long time or tried to be together and this kind of stuff. And the relationship between the actor and the actress is like that. When Bill Balcom heard us play, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning composer, and he heard us play in March just before the lockdown. And he said, you guys remind me of, of the Gurney love letters play. The way you guys play together is so completely complimentary. It's something that could never happen except from having 50 years of playing together. Right. And <clears throat> talking of William Balcom, you have uh, recorded um, all of his work for cello, I believe. That's right. Uh, well, with the exception of one work, which is being written right now for our 50th anniversary, the second cello sonata is in process. As a duo, you have focused um, a lot on uh, romantic repertoire, Beethoven, uh, Schubert, uh, Brahms. What is it about that particular um, music, that, that time in music, that so attracts you? Well, you know, um, I think at my core, as a musician, I'm a, I'm a singer uh, from inside. And as a cellist, the repertoire that's written uh, during the romantic period when the cello becomes really a solo instrument um, and and what do they exploit they exploit the lyricism and the vocal style of the of the cello the cello is an instrument that actually in its is singular in the sense that it encompasses the entire range of the human voice the lowest right. notes of the man to the highest that the woman can sing and so you can move from register to register and accomplish so much with color and range. But, but again, the lyricism of this is what's sort of remarkable about the cello. I think it's what initially drew me to it as a kid or why it, why it took. And, and so the, the celebration of that is, is uh, big time in the romantic period and continues into the 20th century. Uh, at, you know, I suppose, if you were to say, um, 
what is the what is the personality of the bassoon or what is the personality of the french horn or what is the personality of the double bass and each of these instruments has a kind of a shall we say a fach a german word that we use when we're talking about singers you know a fach mm -hmm. it's a means a category of personality so composers that write write an idea for the double bass oh that's a double bass idea that sounds great or trumpets you know dum, da, 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 you know where they have very clean uh fanfare ideas things like that that really stand out in terms of what what inhabits what inhabits an idea that's exactly right for a different instrument and so it's sort of like a chicken and egg thing were you like that before was that your personality before or you played all the music that composers wrote that that and you changed your personality in order to meet the instrumental demand. It's, you know, it's kind of interesting. I know one of the uh, um, most outstanding aspects of the Fisher duo is that you have also commissioned uh, new works for cello and, and piano. And I wonder, do composers write differently for the cello now than they did back in Beethoven's day. Sure. Oh yeah, the very the the first cello sonatas of Beethoven were the very first duo sonatas for cello and piano. And so Beethoven was actually mm -hmm. inventing a medium because cello sonatas have been written before that were basically cello cello melodies with piano or a, accompaniment of some instrument, guitar or or harpsichord, or just another cello, mm. and um, and then when Beethoven did this, he was interested in trying to really showcase the cello as a as a solo instrument. And then he went on in his career, going through the A major sonata from the middle period and the C major and D major sonatas from the late period, to really show develop that relationship to a complete complete parody. Mm -hmm. uh, between the piano and the cello what then that carried on in terms of what how composers look back on that the schumann pieces the um the brahms sonatas for example and moving on into the 20th century the elliot carter sonata is one of our great masterpieces from 1948 where the where elliot dealt with this whole idea what makes it a cello and make what makes it a piano and he dealt with the whole idea is that the cello is a sustaining instrument and the piano is a percussion instrument. And he started with that idea. And then in the course of the sonata, he sort of turns it around and has the cello play pizzicato or plucking the cello and the piano playing these long suspended chords. I mean, so there are lots of, lots of things to do that. Now, to get specific, that's a little a quick history sort of lesson. So what, what do composers, how do they write now? Um, writing in general terms for the cello or for the piano, they understand how the history of virtuosity in the instrument and the history of what other composers have done before them have given them lots of latitude in terms of what a composer can do limited only by their imagination. When mm. composers are writing specifically for the Fisher duo, they'll be writing with us in mind and be looking at certain characters, characteristics of our playing to be able to, to write for that. What does it feel like to, uh, to commission a work and to receive it and know that it has been written just for you and Jeannie? Well, it's a, what kind of a thrill is that? You know, I mean, and, and you understand, um, how long it takes, how much inspiration it takes to get the imagination, to get that energy onto the page, mm -hmm. to be able to be, um, and, and a huge gift to have that come to us. Um, you know, I, I've been commissioning actively since 1967 and I've had really strong relationships with composers throughout my life. And it's one of the great, great joys of my musical life is, are these relationships with composers. And I always just 
have taken it for granted that this is what you do is that you you just keep you keep the uh, medium alive you keep yourself alive and you're looking you're taking a work that's never been done before you can't run out and buy a recording and see how it's supposed to go you have to right. come up to to create the the definitive performance just from your own imagination and conversation with the composer when did you start to play cello when did you begin i started playing the cello on my 10th birthday my, oh really uh, yeah my um um i i was a uh, i sang in in children's choir and this kind of stuff when i was little and then my parents signed me up for piano lessons and i had a very good piano teacher and this kind of stuff and i finally said can i can I play an instrument where I can play with other people, please? You know? <laughs> and so my father was having dinner with um, the conductor of the Plymouth Symphony Orchestra. He, my dad was on the symphony board and he had the conductor over for dinner. And he says, you know, Norman's been talking about trying to, trying to take up an instrument. He says, oh, he should play the cello because there are no cellos in the elementary school orchestra. He should they, they, they need one and he should do that. And so maybe this refers back to that chicken and egg thing, you know, about, uh -huh. about my personality fitting really well. It was a really, a really good match. Who were your cellist heroes growing up? Sure. Well, um, you know, I would sort of, you know, say that the, one that was huge was Pierre Fournier. Um, my, my sort of junior high school teacher was just enamored with everything that he did. And as we know, you get a teacher that is wildly enthusiastic about something, and then you want to know what it is that they're so enthusiastic about. And right. so then I started listening to that. Of course, I listened a lot to Casals um as well and and others but you know i mean thinking just a historical perspective when rostropovich first came on the scene <clears throat> my first impression was this brash ugly kind of sound that he made because he was playing on all steel strings and all these previous cellists were playing on gut strings right. so it was right at an important time of switching over from the, how the how the cello changed in terms of the equipment now everybody's playing on steel strings or some composite and we think it's very beautiful but i think maybe in soviet russia those 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 steel strings were also pretty twangy and not terribly <laughs> attractive uh, uh and that was also before he got a strad and some of these other things too but um but this is a roster poetry ultimately became a significant influence as well. And, um, and then I was lucky enough to study with Richard Kapuscinski, who was my undergrad teacher, who had been in the LaSalle Quartet and was uh, also in the Boston Symphony, um, incredibly dedicated cellist. And then I worked also with Bernard Greenhouse, who had been in the Beaux-Arts Trio, and also with Klaus Adam, who had been in the Juilliard String Quartet. So uh, a lot of fantastic cellists in my life. At what point did you know that the cello was going to be your life? Hmm, really great question. Um, I can't tell you the day, but, <laughs> <laughs> but, but um, when I was going through high school, I had such a passion for music and like a lot of a lot of kids that are in that situation they they do music after school or during school and it's on top of all your school work and this kind of thing and i had two things that i was really passionate about one was history and the other was music mm -hmm. and what i discovered chamber music this was a huge turning point. And um, so I, when I had, when I started 
understanding what chamber music was about and specifically string quartet playing. And there was this team building where everybody was significantly contributing to the team and making something happen and the pride you had in the group process and then the repertoire, which is of course astonishing and, and you know, really, really beautiful. So um, I got sucked in. And then, then my father was watching me get involved and sort of said, you know, we should give him a chance to sort of see what this could do. And so they sent me to the Interlochen Arts Academy for my final years in high school, uh, which is in um, the northern part of the southern peninsula of Michigan, where the Interlochen Center for the Arts is now. And so at the Arts Academy, uh, it was all day, every day, and I still couldn't seem to get enough of it, you know. And then that, then I decided that I wanted to go to be a music major, but I wanted to go to a school where I could also continue my, my studies in history. And so when I went to Oberlin College, which has both the college and the conservatory, I started mm -hmm. to do a double degree in European history and with a cello and then became realized that that uh, that cello was my calling and and history was a was a love but I could that would be a great avocation for me but I had to do I had to do string quartet playing specifically now you can't serve two masters <laughs> <laughs> yeah so there was never any doubt in your mind that as a cellist you were going to you were going to focus on chamber music rather than joining an orchestra and becoming right. an orchestral musician yeah i mean to me it the, my life was about playing playing string quartets and cello was my vehicle to do that does that make sense yes so it's a little it's yeah. a, so i i had to be a good cellist to be in the best quartet i could be and and so that really um, informed a lot of my passion and my direction. Uh, and then it's, you know, basically, you know, I studied solo repertoire and did all this sort of stuff in college. And as you would expect, and then I started, it wasn't when I was playing in the Concord string quartet and we were a 24 seven group. Uh, we did a thousand concerts, 36, Beethoven cycles, 18 Bartok cycles, 50 premieres, I mean, in 16 years. So it was, it was a, it was a whole career in 16 years, essentially, you know, uh, but that did, that came at a certain cost because we were working constantly and, and, and as a team, we, we felt like sort of a SEAL team group, you know, we were it would not be uncommon for us to rehearse eight hours on the day of a concert. And then after the concert rehearse for a couple more. Oh, because really? We had, we had to learn new rep and we had to just get through stuff. I mean, it was really, it was very intense. How did you um, continue to do the, the, the work with Concord and with yourself and Jeannie and the, the duo? How did you negotiate that? Well, so the, Quartet was, you know, we were doing international tours and active concert life. And so then when the quartet would be taking uh, a 10 day break or in the schedule or these kinds of things, then Jeannie and I would, would get our concerts organized for the breaks for the quartet. Mm -hmm. And then that, so that gave us two or three times of the year where we would be playing as a duo and gave us you know opportunities to be able to, to slot that that stuff in and the quartet was was very generous about letting us do that because being in a quartet or a duo uh, a, a small chamber ensemble is is like in many respects like being in a choir it is a you are having to um when you play or when you sing, you, you have to be aware of, of everything that's going on around you because you have to, you have to slot in uh, and, and do your part. And it's, it's a, an accommodation, isn't it? 
Yeah, well, it's actually even more than that because it is, it affects every part of your life. You know, when you, because you understand that you're responsible to the group and that if you do something stupid, stay up all night and party and this kind of stuff and you're wasted the next day or something and you come in, the group is going to be less than it would have been if you'd been in good shape. Right. And, and so you have a, you always have a responsibility to everyone else about how you run your life. And so it's a, always a balancing act that way uh, just in terms of being responsible for the, for the group. Now as a singer, cause I've, you know, I've done professional singing as well uh, as a baritone. Oh, really? And, and uh, sang Guglielmo and Cozy, sang Frank and Flatermouse, Pistruccia Mercado, Morales and Carmen, and then huh. some recital work and this kind of stuff. So I know that when you're really seriously singing, you need, eight, you need eight hours of sleep. You need, there's no substitute for that. The voice has to recover. You have to be right. sensible. You don't want to go to, uh, you know, watch the Houston Rockets and, and scream your head off just before Enough. you're going to do a concert the next day. Uh, so there's, that's, that's what I mean in terms of the responsibility. We, we've talked a little bit about repertoire and uh, your work with, with Jeannie and with the Concord Quartet. Tell me about your cellos. Hmm. How nice. Oh, that's such a fun question. Um, when I had the first cello that I had was a seven eighths cello that my dad and his, uh, my dad was a corporate finance guy and he had a friend who was a violinist who was a corporate finance guy that lived in our town. And his wife was a cellist, so my dad was a pianist, and then they would play piano trios every Tuesday night, you know. And oh, really? So, so the violinist took my dad down, down downtown Detroit and picked up a cello for me. And that's and so on my 10th birthday, he said, here, you know, they gave me the cello. And after a year, I needed a full-size cello, and I got a cello. My second cello was a cello that was made by a local violin maker in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Um and um, then when I went to the Interlock and Arts Academy and we were on two, my teacher said to my dad, he needs a new cello. So when we, when the Arts Academy Orchestra was on tour in Chicago, I got a Simpson cello, an English cello. Um, hmm. That's from the, would be the uh, 18th century. And then about four years later, my next, my Oberlin teacher said, time for a new cello. And <laughs> so uh, I got a Peter Wamsley, which was uh, another English cello of 1750 or so. And it was a beautiful, beautiful, very dark varnish on that. Was sold to um, a daughter of Justice Cardozo uh, from Could the be. Supreme Court, Could, who, who right. bought the cello from me. Um, then the, the next, the next cello that I owned was, um, a instrument made for me by Sergio Perizone, who was an Italian maker who was working at Menix in Philadelphia, which is a violin shop. And, um, and it was, you know, it was an instrument that was commissioned as part of other instruments for a match set for the Concord Quartet. Hmm. The cello that was immediately before mine or just after mine, I can't quite remember, is the one that he made for Jacqueline Dupre. Oh, wow. Which she, which she did all of her final recordings on her Parazone. Hmm. Uh, and so I had this Parazone uh, and then uh, when I was at Dartmouth College with the Concord Quartet, I found this old Dutch cello in the closet and started, it, it was a better match for the strads in the quartet than the, mm -hmm. um, than the Parazone was at that time. And so um, that was made by a Dutch maker called Rambouts. And that was 1702, which coincidentally was the same year as the strad of our first violin, which was 1702. Yeah. So, um, and then I went, you know, I was playing that in the quartet and I still had the Parazone. And then um, 
after the quartet left Dartmouth, I had to find another cello. And so I found an anonymous 18th century cello that looked just like it was going to be right for the for the character of playing that I needed to do, you know, for terms mm. of solo playing, it was a largish instrument. It the Rombouts had a kind of a Ian Partridge kind of uh, tenor, and I I'm a baritone, and so this this moved down into my own vocal range, that bigger cello, and right. especially with a beautiful beautiful bottom in the sound. So I had the Parazone and the and this other Italian cello, and as uh, when I was doing, when Jeannie and I were doing the Beethoven recording, um, I needed uh, the the final disc that we were going to do included the Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata in the arrangement by Carl Czerny. So it's a violin <laughs> sonata that, that Czerny, who was a piano student of Beethoven, had made an arrangement for cello and piano. And Jeannie said, you know, your Italian cello, have you looked at your Parazone lately? because I remember it had a really beautiful A string. And this one is, the C string is amazing, but the A string is not quite as beautiful as the Parazone. And so I said, really? And so I started getting that and I got it, I got it put back into shape by this amazing Luthier who was in Boston. And, <laughs> and all of a sudden I said, she's right. This is really something. So the Paris, I've come back to the Parazone now, which was made for me in 1972. So that'll be, you know, again, coming up on 50 years that I've owned that. <clears throat> and it's really developed and blossomed beautifully through the years. It's, it sounds beautiful. Does the sound of, of, a, of a quality, a high quality cello, does it develop? Does it change over time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the wood vibrates. And, mm -hmm. can, and and so there are channels of vibration that run through the top and the back and the sides of, the, of, of any instrument. And when those channels are reinforced, it makes it easier for the, for the vibrations to move down certain paths. And so um, you break in, you literally break in an instrument. So when I had the Parazone, when I first had it, Oh, gee, I, I, I took it, it's like a wrestling match. I'd, I'd go um, to really get it to start resonating. You know, I, I took it into a spare bedroom and I'd get up in the morning and I'd play as loud as I could on the C string until I was in the spare bedroom. And when I could hear the picture rattle against the wall that I could move <laughs> to the next note. And oh, I wow. <laughs> driving driving the resonance down that, that path, right? Huh. And so then it really started to, and then I'd, I'd put it down and let it rest and I'd go have breakfast. And then I'd come back and so it was sort of, it had its morning calisthenics. <laughs> and, 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 and over time that made a huge difference. And the instruments will change a lot in the first six months and the first year in terms of, of, of doing that. But I can say that the Parazone has taken on my sound characteristics because right. I keep playing sounds a certain way and it keeps coming back to that. It's get, it gets easier and easier to play and the sounds are really in alignment beautifully. So it, it it's really is an extension of your body. Exactly, or even of my imagination, you know, in sound. Yes. Mm -hmm. Have you ever lost your cello? Have you ever left it in a taxi in New York or? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know, gee, I could have gotten great publicity if I'd done that, but <laughs> no, what, the one time that I, that I did uh, leave it somewhere was, um, a, I was doing a masterclass retreat at the Apple Hill Center for the Arts in Nelson, New Hampshire. And it was a Friday night, all day Saturday with a playing a Saturday concert with Jeannie and Sunday morning. And so it was a wall to wall thing for me. And then Jeannie and I were scheduled to play a concert in Randolph, Vermont in the late afternoon of Sunday. 
so we were having this wonderful lunch and everything else at the at apple hill and then had packed the car so we'd be able to take right off mm -hmm. but of course i brought the cello in with me for lunch so in my mind the whole car was packed and we took off and started driving and then all of a sudden realized that we'd left the cello now this is before cell phones right so i pulled off at, at an at an exit and we got onto a payphone, called Apple and said, oh yes, it's here. And we didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> and uh, we called the, the, the presenter for the concert in Randolph, Vermont. They changed the order of the program. So they sent, because it would take too long to go down to pick it up and make it up to Vermont, somebody drove it up for us to, where, to meet us. And then we took off to Vermont and then basically took the cello out and walked out on stage to play the, to play that concert. That's the only time that I've, that I've ever left it anywhere. And I bet your palms were sweaty. Oh, you just, you know, you just wonder what's going on. I mean, it wasn't like I left it and they were taking care of it and they knew what it was, but sometimes if you leave it someplace and they don't know what it is and you know, it's a, it, that could be a problem. <laughs> you have a singer. Besides yourself, you have a singer in your family, don't you? I do. Yeah, absolutely. Actually, I mean, I have a professional singer in the family, um, Abigail Fisher, who is a, um, uh, she's fucking up, as we say. I mean, that's a, again, the German term. She's moving from mezzo-soprano into a sort of, a, into a sort of a, almost a Wagnerian kind of, a German soprano, you know? Right. Um, and so, she does mezzo things, but she also does some of this very, you know, broad uh, repertoire, which is probably right where her voice needs to be these days. And um, she's, again, no stranger to this. She has very strong relationships with composers and, and Missy Mazzoli, the remarkable composer, wrote an opera for her called Song from the Uproar, which is sort of a monodrama on the life of mm -hmm. Isabel Eberhardt, a Swiss young woman who lost her parents and then she went off on her own dressed as a man in northern africa and all the adventures she had it was just kind of amazing just missy was so inspired by this and wrote this wrote this opera for her and she's been involved with several other projects by with new composers and and so on um but she's she's remarkable she married an amazing tenor jason sladen so the two of them have a uh, quite a you know quite an amplitude going on in the household when you get going. <laughs> have you performed with Abigail? Yes. Yes, we have. And actually, we recorded with her um, on our Brahms CD, which came out, I think, in 2018. Uh, we included the Opus 91 songs, which are originally um, uh, with viola as the obligato instrument. So mm -hmm. it's, like, it's sort of contralto, viola, and piano. And this was something where Brahms wrote this as a way of trying to get uh, Joseph Joachim and his wife, who was a professional singer, who were, who were separated to try to get them back together. <laughs> and so <laughs> it didn't, didn't work out, but... Uh, <laughs> but he tried. Uh, yes, exactly, exactly. But that's, so that's... Um, so we have recorded with her and our, our, our other daughter, Rebecca, who's a professional violinist. And the reason why I hesitated a little bit when you said you have a singer in the family is that she's also now branching out with her violin, performing music where composers are writing for her to sing and play at the same time. And at the same time. Yes. Yeah, so she's in, in, in just sort of branching out as a new music artist. She was for 18 years, the, uh, first violinist with the Chiara String Quartet. And right. so I um, also recorded with them a piece by our, our own Houston, Richard Lavenda, who wrote a, a quintet for String Quartet and Extra Cello called Chiaro Scuro. And it's a, a, a beautiful, amazingly, I mean, that's, that's the name of the album that it's on. Um, and it's it's a tremendous piece. Uh, it goes through. It's a bit, uh, 
tumultuous scenes from his from his life and how it resolved itself and so on. But it's brilliant, a brilliant work, and we recorded that together too. When the cello plays with a singer, you mentioned earlier that the the cello is the the instrument that's most akin to the human voice. Cello and singer, whether it be a, a mezzo or a tenor, a baritone, etc. Do they complement each other or do they fight against each other? Oh no, it's all, it's, it's complementary. I mean, um, finding a thread in the way that the musical line works is always, um, it's, it can be extremely complementary. Now, of course, mm -hmm. if the music is, is written in a way that it is contrapuntal in a, in a certain way where music is going against each other, then it's also possible for that to happen if it's or there to put pressure on one or the other. But by its basic nature, it, it is, it's done to be complementary. And, and we're back to the P.A. Yezu, aren't we? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, Norman, thank you so much for talking to us. Um, congratulations on being part of the, uh, the Grammy-winning Durifle album by the Houston Chamber Choir. And uh, best wishes for the 50th anniversary of the, of the duo, the Fisher duo. Please uh, give my regards to Jeannie and stay safe. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much, St. Jen. And like I said, it's a pleasure seeing you and we're maskless. <laughs> <I know. laughs> no, it's a great, great honor and privilege to be with you. And, and it was a real honor to be part of this Houston Chamber Choir project with the Duraflay. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to everyone who supports the Houston Chamber Choir. We really appreciate all that you do. I'm Sinjin Flynn, and this is Behind the Music. Thank you for joining us. The Houston Chamber Choirs with One Accord is your one-stop shop for choral joy. If you enjoyed this podcast, help us to continue our mission to grow the esteem and appreciation of choral music by sharing, reviewing, and subscribing to our content. As a 501c3 nonprofit, support from listeners like you allows us to continue to create new and exciting programming. For more information about us and how you can support our work, please visit HoustonChamberChoir.org/give.